I'm Shane Morris with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Fake news, sex trafficking, and Me Too, corporate corruption, violence, soaring debts, the opioid crisis. It's fair to say that now, in 2019, America has a moral crisis, or to put it another way, an ethical crisis. Well, back in 2011, in the wake of the Great Recession and the financial crisis, Chuck Colson and Princeton professor Robert George combined to produce a six-part video series on ethics called Doing the Right Thing. They enlisted the help of Fox News contributor Britt Hume and gathered a panel of scholars, theologians, and business and government leaders on the campus of Princeton University to discuss America's crisis of ethics in every sphere of public life, in government, education, and the marketplace. Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, we present Episode 1, How Did We Get Into This Mess? This and all of the episodes of Doing the Right Thing were filmed in front of a student audience. Each session ends with the panel taking questions from the students. Let's get started. Here's the series host, Britt Hume. Welcome to all of you who have joined us for this discussion of ethics in American life. Ethics can be described as simply the way things ought to be. But the question is, how do we decide that in our society today? The panel is going to discuss this, and it consists of Dr. David Miller, Princeton Faith and Work Initiative and Associate Research Scholar here at Princeton. Michael Miller, Director of Programs at the Acton Institute. Dr. Robert George, Professor of Jurisprudence here at Princeton. Charles Colson, Founder of Prison Fellowship in the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. And Dr. Glenn Sunshine, Central Connecticut State University Professor of Early Modern European History. As you will see in the 2008 financial crisis, questions arose about first, ethical behavior by the government, second, ethical behavior in financial markets, third, ethical behavior by mortgage lending banks, and fourth, ethical behavior on the part of the public. The financial crisis has rocked the world and shaken markets worldwide. It has caused an upheaval in millions of lives. What went wrong and why did it go wrong? We're going to ask a couple of experts who can provide some insight into this. The first is a well-known television personality, Ben Stein. He's an economist, lawyer, actor, and commentator on American life. You'll also hear from Jim Grant, who is one of the great experts on Wall Street. Jim is the editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. And now we hear from Ben Stein, followed by Jim Grant. To recover from the uh, recession and crash at the beginning of this century, the government was just pumping money into the economy like mad insanity. Uh, basically, the hope was to create some new kind of bubble to replace the tech bubble. And they did replace the tech bubble with the housing bubble. Government is not without responsibility here in many ways. First of all, uh, they funded Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac so lavishly. Uh, the, the fact that these government-sponsored entities were then allowed to contribute to political candidates is astonishingly shocking. That was one problem with the government. The second problem with the government was there wasn't much supervision. I mean, there, there are laws preventing unethical and, uh, fide- behavior and breaches of fiduciary duty. There are laws. The laws against uh, fraud exist. They just never were enforced. So uh, that, that's a big, big issue. The ideal of home ownership, this noble proposition, was that everybody ought to have a home, a house. It was positively seductive. And in administration after administration, Republican, Democrat, especially Democrat, uh, elevated this to uh, a national goal. Uh, the so-called government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, grew into grotesque, toxic institutions. This became a really, really big business because uh, people on Wall Street saw that, uh, first of all, there was hardly any government supervision of it. And what they saw was that they could take large bundles of mortgages They sold them to fiduciary institutions, especially pension funds. At the same time, they sold them short. They sold them short and hammered them like mad by buying credit to fault swap insurance, which is a giant short uh, instrument. And uh, then they uh, basically uh, raked in money. And then at the bottom of the cycle, they bought the bonds back and made money on that part of the cycle. At every level, they were deceiving the people they were dealing with at every level. Almost everyone in a position of financial authority embraced it. Uh, The Fed saw no evil. Our Federal Reserve saw no evil. The ratings agencies, as mentioned, uh, stamped their highest imprimatur on these mortgages. They saw no evil. Wall Street, uh, which was feasting on these transactions, uh, not only saw no evil, but saw a great deal of virtue. (laughs) 
which could be quantified in billions of dollars. That was the virtue of it. Alan Greenspan, in one of his final addresses as head of the, I'm sorry, head of the Fed, said, uh, we're not going to ever have a big credit crisis again because we have these things now called credit default swaps, which have taken the risk out of lending. Well, that turned out to be exactly wrong. Credit default swaps turned out to be a way of magnifying the risk, not minimizing the risk. At the heart of this is an unethical series of acts. At the heart of it was an incredibly unethical act of Wall Street in packaging securities they knew to be fragile and wor often worthless or large, largely worthless. They shouldn't have sold them in the first place. If they were selling them, they should not at the same time have been selling them short. If they were all mortgages for people who really couldn't afford the houses, a thousand of them weren't any more credit worthy than, than one of them. In a sense, there's an ethical issue with the public as well, because the public, to be sure, goaded by the mortgage brokers, was taking on uh, debt that they couldn't repay. And it is not ethical to take on a debt that you can't repay. The role of government here is extremely important because uh, government could have used its moral authority, whatever it, little it has left, to say, uh, look, Wall Street, you've got to stop playing both ends of this game. You've got to stop making loans to people you know can't repay it. And they should have said to the general public, look, take a step back. Watch out for what you're doing here. You're going to wind up in terrible trouble. You don't know what it's like to have your home foreclosed. You're not going to like it. You know, in the aftermath of the bust, in the dark days, 2008 and early 2009, you'd hear our public officials say over and over, let's not have any recriminations. Let's not point fingers of blame. Without accountability, we are all treading water in this murky, lukewarm, milky sea of collectivism, and nothing good comes of it. Let us have individual responsibility. And now we turn to the panel, starting with Britt Hume. So the question is raised, why is there this seemingly widespread moral collapse in America? Professor George. Britt, a culture, any culture, is constituted to a very significant extent by the beliefs and understandings of its people. That's what shapes uh, culture. But when we look at our own culture, we see a high degree of incoherence. On the one hand, people believe that there are some things that are just plain wrong, murder, rape, theft. But on the other hand, the polling data makes very clear that many, many Americans at some level at least claim to believe in what's called moral relativism, the denial that there is any such thing as moral truth or an objective moral truth, that all we have is opinion. There are no right and wrong answers to moral questions, just opinions or feelings. Uh, in fact, one very powerful critic of our culture uh, is Pope Benedict XVI, who has expressed the grave concern that we live under what he calls a dictatorship of relativism, that we're afraid or ashamed to speak out in favor of objective moral truth. But on the other hand, people get into a high dudgeon about the kinds of activities that went on on Wall Street, unethical activities, deceptive activities. So there's an incoherence there. If I can quote Pope Benedict again, uh, he says, the events of the last two or three years have demonstrated that the ethical dimension must enter into economic activity. Now is the time to see that ethics is not something external, but internal to economic rationality and pragmatism. Now that sentiment expressed by the Pope uh, is one that many business school leaders and business school deans have thought about, have expressed themselves, but they don't seem to know what to do about it when it comes to educating students who aspire to careers in business. Uh, Chuck Colson, you've spent some time in the business schools. I think you've, you've heard this expressed by deans. I have indeed. Uh, 20 years ago, a friend of mine gave $5 million to Harvard Business School to set up a chair on ethics. I called him and said, you're wasting your money because an institution today committed to philosophical relativism of the kind Dr. George just described can't possibly teach ethics. Ethics are based on absolute standards of right and wrong. So I wrote an article about it after he uh, told me that he thought I was wrong. It got a lot of publicity. As a matter of fact, got a lot of flack from friends of mine at Harvard. I ended up getting invited to give a distinguished lecture at the Harvard Business School entitled Why Harvard Can't Teach Ethics. And the room was packed, students, faculty, 350 of them. 
I prepared harder for that than any talk I've given in years because I knew I was going to be assaulted by the best and the brightest. When I got all through 45-minute talk and opened it for questions, there wasn't one good question. The students simply were not aware of questions of moral philosophy. It was a very disappointing experience for me because there was just no engagement. Found the same thing at Yale, my own alma mater, Brown University. And it's gotten almost to the silly point because they're talking now about we ought to have a, an ethics oath, a honesty oath when we graduate. Well, that's all right, but what about the three years they're there teaching them what constitutes honesty? And let me let you hear from one recent graduate of a business school. Donovan Campbell just graduated a couple of years ago from Harvard Business School, and here's what he said about the training that he got in ethics. I'm a graduate of Harvard Business School. Uh, I, was, I graduated with, actually with high distinction, so I was named a Baker Scholar, so I was in the top 5% of the class. There were two leadership classes, and one of which specifically focused on the responsibility of business leaders in the context of business, the ethics of business. What made that class difficult is that unlike in the Marine Corps, everyone comes in and Harvard doesn't tell them, all right, here's the deal. Here's right and here's wrong. There's a common set of ground rules that you all just need to subscribe to. And if you don't subscribe to that, you're just wrong. Because unfortunately, the, the school does not subscribe to the idea of ultimate morality, of ultimate good, which is good in and of itself, outside of any context, and which is translatable across cultures, times, it's applicable everywhere. They do not subscribe to that concept. So there might be some who make the argument with some justification that if the context of a culture is bribery, and that is what is culturally acceptable, and that is the way that local business is done, then there is a very compelling case that a first world, let's say, company should come in and, and bribe. Problem is, there's no mandate. There's no fundamental agreement on the way the world works. And so you're reduced to discussing practical behavior in certain situations. We return to the panel with Professor Robert George. Well, I don't think anyone can deny that we have a problem here. Uh, now, our panelists uh, have given a lot of thought uh, to this. Let me, uh, let me turn to David Miller who's given thought particularly uh, to ethics in business and ethics uh, on Wall Street as well as on Main Street. David, give us your perspective. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, to be sure, I think most people don't wake up at the start of the day to go into their office to say, today I'm going to be unethical. Today I'm going to commit the world's biggest fraud. It's a series of steps that takes place over time at which point someone finally crosses a line and goes too far. I, I have taught business ethics at, at, at Yale School of Management. Let me share a brief story. When I was interviewed for that position, the dean uh, said, is there anything else you'd like to ask me? Because I've been in the corporate world first before academia. And I said, well, I do have one question. And he said, what's that? And I said, is it okay if I bring the G word into class? There's this long silence and pause. What do you mean by the G word? And I said, uh, uh, nothing. And he said, I assume you mean God. And I said, that's right. And there's this long pause. And I thought, well, I guess this interview is over. <laughs> but he said, no. And the man was Jewish. And he said, no, I think it's a terrific idea. But the problem is we don't know how to do it. If you could find a way to bring in some eternal voice that transcends cultures and space and history and time and do it in a way that's inclusive of all traditions and not proselytize, he said, we would welcome you to come here and teach. So it's extraordinary the fact that we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to have some sense of higher purpose or meaning or authority. Mike uh, Miller, you've got a lot of uh, experience lecturing at business schools. Well, I also went to business school, and um, it was interesting. When we had discussions on ethics, um, they said, what's, what's um, ethics? They said, well, ethics is following your own integrity or following your conscience. But what if you have a poorly formed conscience? What if you're a jerk, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so plus in integrity, right, the passions are warring against each other anyway, right? Your passions are warring. So, so integrity requires some connection to reason. But what we have is we have a limited notion of reason. It's only the empirical. So we can't talk about justice, truth, beauty, goodness, or anything like that, because that's all a matter of opinion. And who's to say? Don't judge me now, OK? But it's not just business schools. I mean, this is how we're trained to think from the time we're little children. And C.S. Lewis wrote about this um, in, in a fabulous book called The Abolition of Man. So if you haven't read The Abolition of Man, you should read The Abolition of Man. Okay? If you learn one thing, read The Abolition of Man. <laughs> um, but he, he says, in a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We laugh at honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. So what's happened is, the way we've been taught since we were little is we're taught 
that the opposite of a fact is an opinion. And facts are empirical statements, and everything that's good, true, beautiful, right, wrong, kind, compassionate, are just matters of opinion. It, it's embedded in the way we think. So that when we get into business school, and then we get into the business world, and there's literally millions of dollars sitting in front of us, why is it all of a sudden we're going to now you know, throw off the frat boy party self that we had last year, and now we're going to become the most remarkable ethical businessman that the world has ever seen? It just doesn't happen. It's not a shock. It's not like I think Professor Miller said, you don't go into business school and get turned into a monster. Right? Your ethical relativism just gets encouraged and deepened. M Michael, uh, this is exactly what I was talking about when I mentioned the incoherence we find in our own culture. Uh, on the one hand, so many people proclaim themselves to be relativists, uh, to disbelieve in objective moral truth, but so often the same people are the first in line to condemn Madoff for his crimes uh, or any of the other scoundrels that uh, have emerged from this crisis or from scandals in politics or in sports or, or what have you. So we seem to want it both ways. Well, we've heard a pretty provocative discussion here so far. Let's hear what some of the students have to say about it. Yeah, Christian. Thank you very much. The discussion's been really stimulating. I want to return to the question of business schools and ask what you think are some actionable items about the ways in which business school curriculum can be reformed. Are we talking about a mandatory philosophy class in which you read everything from you know, Plato to Augustine and everything after? What do you put on a syllabus? How do you, in a matter of a semester, get people thinking so differently? Obviously, this is a huge systemic question, but we're talking about finite, a finite two-year MBA. I'd love to know your thoughts. David, no. I'll jump in to start. Uh, uh, dean Piper, a former dean of Harvard Business School a couple decades ago, wrote a book called Can Ethics Be Taught? And they couldn't even agree on the answer to that. And it, personally, I believe they can be taught. Whether people can learn is another question. Uh, but I believe they can be. How do you do it? One of the raging debates is, should everybody be an ethicist? If you're teaching marketing, finance, uh, operations, does everyone teach ethics within that? Many will say, but I'm, I'm not personally trained. I'm not professional. I wouldn't know the vocabulary and the nomenclature to teach it in a marketing course or a finance course. Others say, well, it should be an ethical specialist, someone who can draw on the great traditions, uh, moral, philosophical traditions. But it, there's a prior question. It's first that there has to be a commitment to even teach ethics. If it's not pervasive through the whole organization, if it's just relegated or delegated to one professor in one course, I think ultimately the organization will fail. It will be paying lip service to the process. Christian, I, I think it's important to understand that uh, business schools, or for that matter, law schools or medical schools, uh, any area where ethics is important as a dimension of education, cannot solve this problem by themselves. It's a deeper cultural problem. We've got to work on this problem in every dimension. It can't just begin in business school. It's got to begin in homes, in churches, in civic associations, in schools. At every level, we have to be working together to rebuild a consensus around a sound and coherent ethic. Michael Miller responds. First of all, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said. Obviously, you can't solve all the problems because it's a systemic problem. Um, I don't think we should be upset that we can't solve the problems of Wall Street you know, in an MBA program. Um, that's life. You know, Gramsci talked about a long march through the institutions of culture. We've had a long march through. And so now we have to make a long march back. And it's going to take more than one class in business ethics. Um, but I think the other thing is, sometimes there's even a danger of doing the kind of business ethics course, because it basically says, here's Kant, here's Aristotle, here's Nietzsche, here's your feelings. Choose whatever makes you feel happiest. Right? But that's not teaching you how to think clearly. But the big thing I think that business schools need to do is they need to stop corporate social responsibility and start thinking about right and wrong and ethics. But that's a very difficult challenge if the professors don't know how to teach it or think that way. Glenn Sunshine joins in. I would just like to point out where this originates in terms of our educational system. My daughter Elizabeth was in high school at one point, and she had a class on, well, I suppose it would be the closest they would have to ethics. And they defined for her, they said, the definition of the word values is whatever it is that you value. That's what values are, whatever you value. So she came home and said, OK, Dad, so if I value good grades better than I value honesty, it's OK for me to cheat? She got it immediately. It's incoherent. And when you move into colleges, in a lot of ways, you see the same sort of thing. And you see the same sort of behavior carried over. 
A simple example, uh, I assign a, an essay to students. And I tell them, if you're going to use outside sources other than class notes and things like that, you have to footnote it. I get papers in that are cut and paste off the internet. And it's very obvious because they don't even think to remove the hyperlinks. <laughs> um, and yet they see absolutely nothing wrong with this. So they don't understand from early days, they don't understand the issue of integrity, the issue of doing your own work and doing it with excellence. Uh, Chuck Colson, you've been working in the prisons for 35 years. You've probably encountered this. People who are in prison having rationalized behavior that at some level they suspected was wrong, but they had told themselves, well, who's to say what's right and wrong? Well, I started working in the prisons 35 years ago. There were 229,000 people in prison. Today, there's 2.3 million. And so I began very early on to study, why is this? And I read all the criminologists going back 200 years. And what it really turned out to be uh, was what I thought as a believer, as a Christian, a problem of the heart, people making wrong moral choices. As a matter of fact, Dr. Stan Samenow, who's a psychologist, did a 17-year longitudinal study at uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital of thousands of hours of interviews with criminals, why they did what they did, and came up with a really, I think, a startling conclusion. I joined Dr. Samuel Yokelson at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. He wanted to understand the mental makeup of men who made crime a way of life. And in the beginning, Dr. Yokelson did what he did with his earlier patients in Buffalo. He probed for their early histories to try to find out why they were the way they were. You name it, they came up with it. They were deprived in the inner city. They were overindulged in the suburbs. It was mothers who didn't love them enough, mothers who loved them too much. It was peer pressure. It was poverty. Well, practically everything but the federal deficit has been blamed for criminal behavior. Um, even global warming, believe it or not, in scholarly articles has been pointed to as a cause of crime. Well, what Yokelson found after years spending up to, and this may be hard to imagine, 8,000 hours with some of these men, what he found was that none of the causes of crime that he subscribed to himself when he started in this study, stood up. I have now been in this field of evaluating and counseling offenders for 40 years. And in almost every case where I've interviewed somebody who did come from really a terrible environment, meaning that there, it was gang infested, there were drugs, there were firearms, families were broken. Do you know that in almost every case in interviewing the offender he had a brother or a sister and maybe more than one who grew up under the same circumstances, in the same neighborhood, in the same family, and faced the same adversities. So what has impressed me more and more, it's not the environment that a person comes from, but how he chooses to deal with life. People don't choose the circumstances into which they're born, but they do make choices and they make certain moral choices about how they're going to deal with life. What is critical is what is in the mind of the offender, the choices that he makes. So there are many thought patterns that really the person has to recognize, errors in thinking that he makes, and then to learn and implement correctives. That is the heart of the change process. It really is a conversion to a way of life that he has heard about Others have exhorted him to lead, but he has rejected thus far at every turn. Professor uh, Sunshine, um, a lot of people today uh, will hold back from affirming that there are ethical truths, moral truths, because they fear that to believe in moral truths is somehow to be discriminatory. On the other hand, and here comes that incoherence again, why would one worry about being discriminatory if there weren't something ethically wrong with it? In other words, they're appealing to a moral truth even in the process of denying a moral truth. Yet at the same time, abstractly, they want to define themselves as relativists. How did we get here? How did we get into this situation of incoherence? The key to this is to understand that 
a few centuries ago, we had an integrated vision of life where morality, uh, the physical world, ethics, metaphysics, all of these things were wrapped up into a single coherent package. Then there was a shift in the culture where uh, there was a growing emphasis on uh, the material world as being the world of objective fact, uh, objective knowledge, um, and everything else got sort of pushed aside into the realm of, of opinion, faith, those sorts of things. Now, this worked okay for a while because we were uh, living on what uh, Van Til calls borrowed capital. The fact is that the Christian ethical foundations of Western civilization continue to have an influence in shaping our culture's values and behavior. That can only last so long, though, when there's no foundation left for it. Um, so what's happened is that over time, the Christian moral foundations that allow you to make the kinds of ethical and moral judgments that you're talking about here have deteriorated. So that they're, they're still exerting some sort of influence on the society so that we still say things are right and wrong, but increasingly our behavior is lining up more with the underlying belief that the material world is all that's really real and everything else is just a matter of opinion. When you begin to see, as Professor Sunshine said, the deterioration of these values in our society, and now they're accelerating, why are we surprised when there's a lack of ethics in government, Wall Street, the lenders, people, the prisons? It's an inescapable consequence of neglecting moral training. We're in an ethical mess because of that. We're all paying the price and we're all pointing fingers at other people, well, the real problem is all of us aren't addressing the need for character formation in our lives. That's one of the subjects we'll be coming to in this series. But that's at the heart of the breakdown that we're seeing in American life today. Who's got a question? Who's got a thought? P please. My name's Kristen Nivling, and I actually attend the seminary here at Princeton. And I'm wondering when people who agree that there is an objective morality disagree, how do we solve those problems? Yes, that's a wonderful question. Uh, notice that two people or three people or five people can be in perfect agreement about there being an objective morality, but have completely different views about the content of, uh, of objective uh, morality. I, I wonder if any of the students would, uh, would like to, to venture a reply to the question. I, I have educated some of you, so I know you know the answer. <laughs> Yes, uh, I see Bobby Marsland back here from Princeton University. Well, I think when you come down to the case where you have two people who agree that it is possible to know what a moral truth is, then we finally have a case where they can actually get down to seriously arguing and engaging with each other. They can say, why do I think that this is the objective moral truth? The other person can say why he thinks that his other view is the moral truth. And they can go and examine the roots of their, their moral beliefs and come down to see which one is reasonable. They might not agree at the end of the day. They can, there is disagreement just because we're human beings, we don't have perfect intellects, uh, but they can actually engage with each other and try to seek the truth. Well, let me ask you this question. In our political system, how do we deal with the fact of disagreement? That's what the real issue is. How do we get along? How do we manage things when we disagree? This is not a hard question. <laughs> it's called democracy. We vote. We don't take out guns. And we don't just vote, do we? We talk first. Our democracy at least aims to be a deliberative democracy. That's why we value free speech so much. Free speech is important so that people can debate, so we can deliberate. We can consider each other's arguments and the counterarguments. And then at the end of the day, we vote. But that means in a system like ours, and I think this is the direct answer to your question, in a system like ours, there are no ultimate final victories because the losing side can always come back if it remains unpersuaded. Now, so sometimes a consensus will emerge. Today we have a consensus, thank God, on the evil of slavery. But we don't have a consensus on an issue like abortion. We haven't had it for, for 40 years. And as long as democracy is respected, and in that particular case it hasn't been because the Supreme Court has taken that out of the democratic process, but democracy keeps fighting back, wanting to resolve it by deliberation among the people rather than simply a fiat by the Supreme Court. But in any event, 
uh, uh, even if someone, one side loses, they always have the opportunity because they have free speech, they have elections, to come back and persuade their fellow citizens that they've got it wrong and it's time to think again. So we don't have to worry that uh, if we affirm an objective moral truth, somebody is going to tyrannize somebody else. Democracy is the remedy for that. Democracy is the anti-tyrannical principle that we put in place to deal with moral disagreement. Michael Miller responds. But consensus does not equal truth. This is clearly what Plato saw in, in, when, when he has Thrasymachus who says that, that justice is merely the rule of the stronger. And so you're really facing this question, if there's no objective truth, if the truth does not exist and it cannot be known, then justice becomes merely whoever has the power to enforce that. And that becomes very dangerous. It would be hard not to conclude from today's discussion that we have a major ethical crisis in American life that affects everything and every place from Wall Street to Main Street to prisons. In the succeeding sessions, we'll be talking about whether we can know what is right, and then the most important question of all, once we know what is right, do we have the will to do it? You'll want to be sure to join us for these sessions. From the campus at Princeton, I'm Britt Hume. Shane Morris here again. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast and our special presentation of Chuck Colson and Robert George's series, Doing the Right Thing. Join us next week for part two, Is There a Moral Law and Can We Know It? For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.